Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're just going to give it maybe another minute because people are still filtering in. Um, but thanks for joining us. We'll start very shortly. All right. Thank you again so much for being here. We're really excited to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Jen Krava. I am the Director of Programming and New Initiatives here at Forecast. And I am coming to you from land stolen from the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Um, just a couple of things before we get into the content. Uh, we are recording this and you will get a, a link to the recording. Um, we'll email that out to you all tomorrow so you can have that. And then this is also closed captioned. So if you um, go to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to access the closed captioning. Mark and I are going to present and then at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. So as we're going through, please put your Q&A in the Q&A section. Um, again, my name is Jen Krava. I'm Director of Programming and New Initiatives and I'm joined by my colleague, Mark. Mark, I believe you are on mute which means it's really a Zoom webinar now. Hello, <laughs> Mark Salinas here, dialing in from Reno, Nevada, uh, native lands of our Washoe, Paiute, and Shoshone people, past and present. I'm really excited to be here today with you, Jen, thanks. Thanks, Mark. So as I said, we're, we're gonna talk about artists and transportation today, and really what we're doing is building on our latest issue of Forward, which focuses on how artists can creatively approach transportation challenges and impact their communities. We would like to thank our funders for helping to make events like this possible here at Forecast. And we um, are accepting donations if you're interested in helping to support us to be able to do more activities like this. Um, in this session, we're going to share some pretty tactical information about um, how artists can do just what we talked about, address challenges in transportation. We'll start by just talking a little bit about who Forecast is, and then talk about our approach to this project through public art and um, some considerations that came into play as far as site and stakeholder. And then we'll talk about three different case studies that um, we participated in in partnership with Smart Growth America. So Forecast. This is our mission. We are really focused on advancing uh, justice, health, and human dignity through public art. We are a 42-year-old public art nonprofit that is based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, we basically do three things. The first is that we support, fund, and train artists who work in public. Um, we do this through grants for artists who are based in Minnesota to either work on projects or uh, participate in research and development or professional development activities to advance their public art careers. We also spend uh, a, a lot of capacity on trying to expand access to the public art field and projects for BIPOC artists because we know that they have not had the same opportunities um, in this field. So we really focus on how we can create equitable uh, selection processes to bring more BIPOC artists into the field. We also partner and consult on public art projects. Um, we work with private and public partners all across the country and even internationally um, to help secure artists for commissions, to do public art master planning and arts and culture planning. Um, we do really deep community engagement work um, and we also facilitate and develop curriculum and different workshops, both in person and a lot more online these days, 
um, for artists, as well as municipalities or nonprofits or um, other agencies who are interested in commissioning public art projects. And then the third thing that we do is build local capacity, gather stories, and share research. I mentioned Forward at the beginning of this. Um, that is our digital publication. Um, we just released our second issue, and really the focus of Forward is to talk about how artists can impact other sectors in creative ways, um, and that it's not just public art in its own silo, but that artists can really work across sectors to address challenges in creative ways. We have an awesome team of consultants, Mark is one of them, um, that works on these projects, again, all across the country. And in recent years, we've been, we've been working a lot more to expand the consulting side of public art to BIPOC consultants as well, because we know that there are barriers into that too. So that's a little bit about forecast. Um, let's talk about arts and transportation. So, Last year, we partnered with Smart Growth America on their Arts and Transportation Rapid Response Project. Um, we started this last summer. It was funded by Kresge and the NEA. Um, and what we really tried to do was partner transportation agencies with artists to develop creative solutions that are specifically related to COVID challenges in their transportation agencies. Um, we wanted to, or we know that artists their creative practices um, can really enhance the agency's responses to these challenges um, and help them think about different ways that they could quickly shift what they were doing to create atmospheres that, that um, help facilitate mask wearing, um, staying six feet apart from each other, um, all of those social distancing, but also communicating rapidly with constituents and riders about how they're addressing these changing rules and regulations. Um, we issued an open call for proposals from transportation agencies around the country and got an astounding 200 applications. Uh, so we knew that there were a lot of, of agencies thinking about this. Uh, we selected five agencies to be paired with an artist to address their project. You can see the artists here. Um, and then we partnered with SGA, Smart Growth America, to curate the artists who would partner with each agency. Um, we did that through uh, a nationwide call for artists that artists could sign up for, but we also had conversations with local arts nonprofits and arts councils, um, and we also did some reviews of artist portfolios so that we really had a comprehensive idea of who was doing work um, and, and could work in this way with transportation agencies. Each of the projects committed to addressing COVID-related transportation challenges and systemic inequities, and we also in addition to curating the artists, we provided mentorship and training for them. Um, and today we're gonna to talk about three of those five projects. We'll talk about each project as far as what the challenge for the, for the city or the transportation agency was, the project itself and how it unfolded, um, as well as what the reflection points were and what we learned from it so that hopefully you can take those away with you and start to implement them into your own projects. So I'm going to pass it over to Mark to talk a little bit about how we approach public art um, and the considerations for the projects and collaborators and audiences. Mark. Thanks, Jan. This is such an exciting project to be on. And we've actually revisited a 2.0 project that we're working on <clears throat> right now. So I'm going to talk about four elements that I brought to uh, the discussion for these artists and agencies to help um, better connect the uh, mission and the project to the communities and the needs at hand. One was, you know, I like um, an umbrella approach, uh, big data approach, so that we're all on the same platform, understanding that the intersectionality of arts and transportation is not uncommon. Uh, the arts, the intersection of arts with healthcare or community de development is things that we see every day. 50% uh, of hospitals nationwide have an in-house arts program because it's been connected to patient healing. And there, nearly seven out of 10 Americans uh, see the arts as providing healing and healthcare <clears throat> experience. These are, this is some data pulled from Americans for the Arts Economic Impact Statement. On the community development side, uh, over 70% 
degree uh, agree that uh, arts improves the identity and quality and livability and, uh, and it helps provide that platform, that foundation for a thriving community. So these are the, the, the data that I like to take our, our first step on uh, such projects with. Next slide, please. Um, on a more local level, you know, identifying the pillars of what these communities are comprised of. Um, my personal belief is that education, creation, and relation are three components um, that build essential communities where we want to live, work, and revisit. And uh, I come from a perspective that um, it's the magnetism of these three core elements that create uh, good public art programming almost in an architectural sense, right? Where we're uh, socially, where we act as a social architect, we draft opportunity, structure awareness, and build the foundations of interconnectivity. What you see here is um, some of the project considerations. In speaking with these artists in different parts of the country and with different uh, backgrounds and with, diff with agencies having um, different um, needs and interests. There's not one single project that's going to fulfill all of the, uh, check all, all of the boxes, right? But it's our responsibility here at Forecast and as, as arts administrators and even as artists to prioritize how we want the public's, um, our audience's behavior to be influenced or changed or redirected in this effort. So what we see here is David Kolb's uh, 1984 um, learning chart. And I like to bring this up because um, I challenge the artists to think of their project and where on this grid would they place the sticker of, of what their concept is? Is this something that we want the public to watch or do? Uh, to watch from a distance or participate in actively? Is it um, something that we want to evoke a feeling where we're actually um, uh, going to take action upon that feeling or more of a um, abstract thinking where we identify or see something in a new manner. Lastly, um, you know, certainly to anchor any project, not only does it have to be site specific, but it needs to be specific to, you know, that community. Um, and this is, I would not call this a, um, a, um, what do they call that, a, a food chart? I would call this uh, an extension ladder, right? Because an extension ladder, no matter which way you put it, you still get to where you're, you wanna go. And so um, this extension ladder is something that we provided to the artists to allow them to see where they were um, and who, that they can, who they can rely upon. Um, in planning their project and executing their project. Um, certainly the project is going to change over time and it certainly you know, changed with uh, health regulations and advisories throughout the, pro throughout the period that we um, uh, manifested this project. But here you'll see the grand tours, uh, you'll see Smart Growth America and Forecast, the transit agencies, uh, asking the artists to consider the um, staff employees at these agencies, the public information officers, how their quotes go out, how we uh, video uh, document this so it can be used to inform as many people in the community as well. Um, at these places at where these artworks were cited, um, if you were to take your, your, your finger and just go like this, what are the nearby businesses and who are the local officials that can help um, strengthen uh, the cause of this, um, of this artwork. Uh, so let's start off with uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, this is in Clark County and the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada worked closely with Ashley Harrison Doty and myself uh, at Forecast to design signage that would effectively educate the public about social distancing and safe transit riding practices at their main hub, the Bonneville Transit Center, which is a 24-7 um, hub. Here you can see uh, the, product, the project team, and I want you out there to try to see where you are in this. 
Um, if you're a transit agency, maybe you can see a title there. If you're not a transit agency, imagine what that title would be in your department and who you can bring to the table to uh, make something realized so you can turn your ideas into action. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. So the challenge, like most transit agencies, that the RTC has faced uh, during COVID-19 uh, was to, you know, how do we remain uh, committed to uh, providing safe transportation to our community uh, and stay operative at the same time? So the RTC serves the Las Vegas metro area and is responsible for connecting frontline workers, residents, and tourists to employment, essential destinations, and attractions. Now, tourism was down significantly uh, from 2019, but they had still welcomed millions of visitors since, begin since the beginning of the pandemic, over 1.7 million visitors in September alone. Uh, the RTC sought to work with an artist to design and implement creative signage at one of their main transit hubs, effectively educating the public about social distancing and safe transit riding practices. Next project, next uh, slide, please. Uh, with help from Forecast Public Art, Smart Growth America selected and hired Ashley Harrison Doty to design creative signage uh, to provide additional guidance uh, for these, uh, for the transit riders, as well as the staff. Uh, Ashley, in consultation with RTC and myself, created a cohesive concept for signage that combines images of well-known clay locations on the Las Vegas Strip in nearby natural landscapes and overlaid friendly phrases encouraging people to wear masks and maintain a safe distance from each other. She also conducted a series of in-person site visits with RTC staff and vinyl specialists to select the best locations to install the signage. Ashley's vision for the project is anchored in her previous work, which focuses on the importance of approachable vernacular, the marriage of symbolism and language. Uh, considering the stress, despair, and strict regulations associated with COVID, Ashley wanted to use a friendlier, softer approach, like how she might speak to a friend, something that would be, that would be more memorable. To ensure the language would resonate, Ashley used a combination of social media polls, public surveys, and conversations with staff to develop messages both in Spanish and in English. So the results of the project, uh, while the signage was just installed at the end of October, the hope is that it will help encourage people, October 2020, the hope is that it will help encourage people at the uh, transit center to wear a mask properly, hold up over their noses, uh, six feet away from each other indefinitely, right? Um, moreover, Ashley hopes that the signs make people realize that by following these protocols, we are keeping each other safe. So here are some installation images of what Ashley um, installed all throughout, really marrying the, uh, her graphic designs with the architecture of the building itself. For transit agencies around the country seeking to launch similar messaging initiatives, Consider the following reflections. Be deliberate about where you place your signage. Through a series of in-person site visits accompanied by the contracted vinyl specialists, uh, Ashley deliberate, deliberately selected certain locations to place the signage. For example, they took into consideration where people arrive at the station, where they board the buses, where they sit, stand, relax. Uh, Ashley shared that if people are coming off the bus, they'll most likely encounter vertical elements, whereas they are sitting and relaxing Whereas if they are sitting and relaxing in the plaza, they'll find more signage on the ground. So really looking into the uh, habitude of, of the writers. Uh, secondly, use friendly language to improve compliance with COVID safety protocols. Uh, Ashley's use of friendly informal language sort of contrasts with what we um, would normally see. And I think through that, she was eliciting a second look, which is really what we needed for this health PSA. Um, the goal was that by using this friendly messaging, um, everyday people would find it more uh, relatable and they would be more likely to comply with safety guidances. Lastly, explore material options early. For projects with short timelines, we recommend exploring, material, exploring project materials early in the process 
and seeking out price estimates before even beginning the design process. Um, after deciding on materials and vendors, work closely with them as their expertise can help save time in terms of sizing and location selection. This is especially important when working on environments as harsh as Las Vegas with strong color fading sun. In this project, we use, utilize vinyl for its long-term durability and ability to adhere to various surfaces, including concrete and glass. So uh, that's what we did here in Las Vegas. And you can see some of the lovely imagery um, in both Spanish and English that we quite, uh, were, were fond of and thought was successful. The next uh, project that we're gonna talk about is the one that we did in Oakland, California. So we paired artist Jonathan Brumfield with the city of Oakland to pilot a solution for more aesthetically pleasing and sturdy slow streets barricades in the city of Oakland that better reflect the communities where they are located in East Oakland. Um, but another goal was to also continue to promote and support safe distancing while traveling and exercising during the pandemic. So in partnership with East Oakland residents, Jonathan built a set of four barricade planters and a set of corresponding culturally relevant signage. So you can see here all of the folks who were involved in this project. The challenge from the city, again, was that they launched their Slow Streets program last April, so April 2020, to support physical activity and reduce overcrowding on trails, parks, and sidewalks during the pandemic. And so they closed over 20 miles of streets to, to motor vehicles and made them only pedestrian and bike friendly. After implementation, the city set out to evaluate the program and gather feedback from residents across the city. And they found that residents in East Oakland, which is a historically and predominantly black community that's undergone decades of disinvestment, shared that the slow streets barricades were unattractive, they were confusing, it made it look like a construction site um, and they were not meeting the needs of the community members who lived there. So the, um, the city then sought to figure out how they could respond to the community through this project by working with an artist to pilot a solution. We really thought about this as a pilot to figure out how it might work and how it could be expanded and scaled across the city um, for, again, more aesthetically pleasing, sturdier barricades, that better reflect the East Oakland culture. So we hired Jonathan Bromfield. And in addition to being an artist, Jonathan is, um, he's also an educator and he works with youth at a local nonprofit and also at a, at a higher education institution. Um, he's also deeply aware of the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on black and brown neighbors and his community's concerns with the Slow Streets program. So he already knew about how the community felt about Slow Streets and was interested in helping figure out how to, to change that and make it more relevant. So keeping that at the front of his mind, he worked with a um, group of neighbors and the city to design culturally informed, beautiful, sturdy barricades that improved access to healthy food um, while still supporting the safe transportation and recreation. He, again, we thought about this as, as a very, or a, sorry, a pilot project that would help through the pandemic, um, not only provide food for folks, but also promote activity outside, um, exercising and traveling throughout the pandemic. He built a set of four barricade planters and a set of corresponding culturally relevant signage. But before he drafted the designs, he reached out to his neighbors and young folks to share the project goals and learn more about which locations in East Oakland where the slow streets were happening should be used to pilot this new design and what they would like to see included. So he really thought about the community and brought their voices into the project, even though this was a really short turnaround and um, a pilot. He then worked with a family in East Oakland to build these barricades um, and created the planters through them and then painted the artwork on the exterior of the planter that featured people riding scraper bicycles, which is a unique aspect to Oakland culture, children walking, people pushing strollers, 
And he also included words of hope, like heal, justice, and grow. He also created a corresponding set of signage to accompany the planter that featured similar artwork. So the results in early October of last year, um, he unveiled the planter barricades. And on the left, you can see that the mayor actually came. That's not the mayor, but um, the mayor and some of her um, constituents and, and fellow staff members came for this unveiling and talked about how important it was that they piloted this project and could expand it across the rest of the city. Um, they're currently working, the city is currently working with Jonathan to replicate this so that they can incorporate it into their permanent slow streets signage. The, the feedback following the unveiling that happened has been largely positive and he's already been approached by other elected officials and community leaders who are interested in building planter barricades for their slow street uh, initiatives. So some things to take away. One is to work with artists who are rooted in their communities. Um, feedback and concerns from the East Oakland residents about the Slow Streets program was the impetus for this project. So having someone who is engaged in that community and deeply rooted there um, helps to address the community concerns. He was, Jonathan was well suited for the project um, because of his expertise as an artist and because of the fact that he's a resident embedded in the community that is affected by this. Um, he also spent a considerable amount, a considerable amount of time as the face of the project at the intersection where the barricade planters would soon be placed. So he was out on the street talking to people to explain the project and what would happen. He fielded questions, talked about um, how the barricades would work, built them with community members, shared flyers. He was seen as a trusted voice within the community um, and that was really vital to the project's success. Another takeaway from this was to be experimental and test out new projects or, or approaches. I mean, you know, this was really a pilot and the city thought about it in that way. They knew that it was going to be something that they tested that hopefully then they could continue to build upon and expand. Um, that, just having that mindset allowed the city to be even more flexible and experimental as Jonathan started to develop and continue developing this project over time. And then a third takeaway is don't forget about maintenance. That's a really important part, right? Uh, I mean, these other two takeaways are also really important, but sometimes maintenance gets completely forgotten. Um, even though it was a pilot, Jonathan really thought about the long-term maintenance of these and what that meant as far as staff capacity and neighborhood capacity. While the planters are durable and they're built to last, there is still questions like who's going to water the plants? Um, he, Jonathan actually coordinated with a local nonprofit to have their youth interns water the plants moving forward, but it was a, something that he was thinking about from the very beginning. What if the artwork gets damaged? How do we ensure that the community feels ownership over these planters? All of these things were, were maintenance questions that Jonathan was thinking about and brought solutions to those questions by spending time in the neighborhood on the corner where these barricades were so that he could have conversations with neighbors and understand what kinds of ownership and, and um, ambassadorship they would like to have over this project. Okay, on to the third project in, in San Francisco. So we've uh, discussed uh, bike, uh, sorry, bus. We've discussed streets and now we're gonna discuss rail. So uh, Bay, Area, Bay, Area, Bay Area Rapid Transit worked with artist Tasha Stimage to pilot an approach to normalize the culture of wearing masks on transit and deconstruct the racism worsened by COVID-19. Tasha designed and implemented a campaign consisting of pop-ups, posters, and video montage that encouraged writers to reimagine masks and their benefits. Here's the project team and the staff at BART forecasts and smart growth America. So let's talk about the challenge. So, uh, you know, nationwide COVID has resulted in serious issues and concerns for people of color um, due to racially motivated harassment and violence. Uh, the political battles over masks has created a hostile environment that has caused transit users to distrust and profile one, each, one another. So Bart recognized uh, the additional stigma uh, face, facial coverings and um, 
wanted to uh, create a, an education uh, awareness experience to ensure that transit is safe and welcoming as possible for all riders. So the project itself was one where Tasha designed and implemented. Um, let's go to the next slide, please, Jen. Although I love that picture. Uh, what Tasha designed and, and Tasha designed and implemented a campaign that encouraged riders to reimagine what masks were and celebrate the benefits and their history. So with riders in mind, she created a series of eight unique print posters featuring different cultural masks that were installed in BART stations and on the trains. Each poster included information about the mask's culture and usage, as well as a powerful tagline intended to encourage people to rethink the benefit of wearing masks. Tasha also held two pop-ups at Civic Center Station in downtown San Francisco to educate riders about the rich history of mask wearing. Tasha and Bart staff safely engaged with riders and handed about 300 giveaway bags containing masks, uh, hand sanitizers, alcohol wipes, individual hand straps and postcards so that riders could stay in touch with friends or family far away. To add another visual element to the pop-up, uh, Tasha worked with another artist to create a video montage of different ceremonial uses of masks. Uh, the results of the project, um, and this was a two month long project, and in two months, Bart knew that they wouldn't eradicate um, the racism that exists on public transportation. Instead, they hoped to open a dialogue that acknowledged um, the racism experienced by writers of color and then pilot creative solutions to address it. By working with Tasha, Bart was able to effectively convey the importance of masks in a visually engaging and even joyful manner that didn't look like a traditional transit message. So if you're looking to launch a similar initiative, welcome back riders or retain riders, here are some things to consider. Number one is acknowledge and appreciate your riders. Um, these pop-ups receive an incredible level of positive feedback from customers and uh, staffers who appreciated being seen and being offered that small uh, gift. Rider appreciation, especially during stressful times like these, goes a long way in helping people feel that they've made the right choice in staying or returning to transit. Uh, secondly, set loose project parameters, uh, especially in experimental stages and initial stages, to leave room for the creative exploration uh, by the artist. As with all projects, setting goals and parameters is important, right? What cannot be uh, managed cannot be, uh, what cannot be measured cannot be managed, right? But if your agency is seeking to creatively address a challenge, then it is important to be flexible and bold to open ideas and provide space for creativity, providing room for the artist to adjust direction and brainstorm daring solutions, especially in the early stages of the project will pay off in the end. Lastly, prioritize space for dialogue and trust building on project teams, especially for projects with short timelines. Um, addressing racial profiling and bias is not a simply simple or easy solution. Uh, easy, you know, uh, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not simple uh, or an easy problem to address um, within a system like public transportation. But to do so effectively requires project teams to make space for trust building, communication dialogue and to be honest about potential issue, issues up front. Thank you, Mark. So these were just three of the five projects that we worked on with Smart Growth America for the Arts and Transit Rapid Response Project. Um, as Mark said, we are in phase two of that and we're working with three more uh, communities across the country to address their COVID related transit challenges. And our latest issue of Forward has even more of those stories um, about how artists are creatively addressing transportation issues across the country. So we'll include a link to that issue in the um, email that we send with the link to this recording tomorrow. So we've got about 20 minutes um, 
left to talk to answer any questions. So I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen here um, so that we can take a look at the questions. And I'm going to just do this so that you can see all of us. Um, we have a question here from Bruce. Um, it says, if there's a best approach to a public artwork in a specific context, how might we understand that context, i.e. jury, population, cultural, psych, historical, architectural environments? Mark, I feel like this sort of relates to some of those first slides that you were talking about. Do you want to, do you want to start this one? Sure, thanks, Jen. You know, the The approach to public art it should be a democratic one, right? An open ap approach, a transparent approach, Bruce, that um, is rooted in the community's interests and concerns, not, uh, as well as offering the community to become a, stake a stakeholder in providing input. So in making a public art or even public programming site-specific we're not just talking about um, making it uh, fit in a in you know in the roundabout in the center of town. We're also looking to make it fit in the context of the history, um, the present, the past, present, and even future concerns of of that community. Um, in understanding the context, i.e., jury population, cultural. This is all, you know, homework that um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and saying a good arts administrator will advise the artist in taking into consideration. Um, you know, the what's unique about these projects that we're showing you now is that you know we we all know that uh, studio art is very different from public art um, and who it serves. Um, Throughout the process, you know, both the agency is getting their information from the writers and the artist is getting their information from the agency. Together, looking at the site, they come up with uh, solutions and, they, and throughout the entire duration of this project, we would meet uh, weekly to sort of, uh, to sort through them and see what was the best uh, solution for what was identified as the problem. What's interesting now, Bruce, is, uh, uh, is that on one of the um, projects that we're working on now, not only is it uh, addressing COVID, but in um, Georgia, we're also working with Marta on addressing the unhoused population as ridership during COVID. So there are a lot of social concerns that are brought to the table. I see you mentioned culture, um, psych, that, uh, that informs the decisions and the outcomes. You know, it's about, I spoke a little bit about ridership um, habits and uh, that played a part too. I hope that answered that question a bit. Thanks for that, Mark. I'll, I'll just add, um, I also really like Mi Wan Kwan's book called Locational Identity, it's one, one place after another. And she talks about site, um, not just as a physical space, but as a situation. So what is the historical situation or the cultural situation? What are those arcs and how does the project that you're working on fit within those arcs? And like you said, Mark, both for what has already happened and what might come ahead. And I think one of the, one of the ways to think about approaching that is to go back to that sort of stakeholder extended ladder that we looked at at the very beginning and have conversations with, with those people to understand, you know, like what actually is the context to them as they live in, in the area, um, historically, culturally, physically, right? So I think having conversations and really talking to a, a slew of stakeholders in the project will help you start to understand that in a different way and help you build a project, not just for a place, but with a place and with a community. Um, we've got another question here. It says, thank you for a fantastic overview of these projects. How can we measure the impact of them? Mark, do you wanna start that one too? Sure. 
Um, in our final reports, getting back to the transit agencies, a lot of that, a lot of that data was from them. And they had received not only feedback from riders, un unsolicited feedback from riders, which is always pleasant, positive feedback from riders, but also from staff. And I love projects that not only are addressing the people who pay to utilize the service, but the people that the agency pays to implement that service. And um, of course, the measure of impact is gonna be a bit different for each one. Um, for Tasha's, you know, all 300 of those bags uh, went out. So we know that those are indeed 300 touch points with um, riders on furthering their education. Um, we do have, I guess, Jen, we could direct them to the final uh, report mm -hmm. that, um, that that we pulled together for this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Ashley, you know, sometimes artists will identify with this when they're in the process of making something in public, the public interacts with them, right? And some of these anecdotal stories of just saying, you know, thank you, great, and just seeing those smiles um, are some of the moments that data doesn't reflect, but are equally um, as important. I totally agree that that anecdotal information is really important and sometimes can't be quantified necessarily. Um, so how do you capture that? And, and I think just, I think one thing that's really important is going back to the project over time and following up with those people in that extended stakeholder ladder, right? If you're talking to them at the beginning to understand how they'd wanna participate, what's going to resonate with them, you can then follow up over time again with those same people to say, hey, is this still meeting those things that we talked about at the beginning, right? And that's a way to, to really understand what the impact has been um, on multiple different levels. We've got another question. Any advice on how to get state level transportation agencies or DOTs to work collaboratively with artists? I might jump in on this one, Jen. Do it. Um, Cindy, I would um, recommend getting in touch with your state arts agency, which is a, a state department to create um, those introductions. And, uh, you know, while all SAAs have been impacted by, um, their budgets have been impacted by COVID nationally. Uh, I think it is exciting when state arts agencies provide programming that cross pollinate with other departments. Certainly we see it happen on a local level. Um, I would like to see it happen more on a state level as well. I'll add that there are a few um, DOTs around the country that have artist and residency programs. And so, and, and I know that there are case studies that have been written up about those. Minnesota is actually one of those, MnDOT has one. Um, there's one in Washington state. And I know that Smart Growth America has, has worked on a lot of that work as well and has case studies on those. Um, they've also done some sort of artist fellowship opportunities related to DOTs and transportation. Um, I know in Northwest Arkansas was one place where they did that, um, but there were other locations as well. So I'd say, you know, looking at where this is already happening because it's proven practice in these places um, can help you pull information together to, to talk with your DOT and see what kinds of information you can take from those case studies to build your own program in some way. Um, the next question, I love the BART project with the masks, so do we. Is there a place to learn more about and share this project? Were the masks chosen from San Francisco Museum collections? The use of these objects in this context is really thinking outside the box. Yeah, totally. Um, Tasha really drove that. And um, Mark, maybe you know more about how she chose those masks. Um, but she really took that and ran with it and thought about how, how she could expand the narrative and also expand not just the narrative around COVID, but about masks in general and what that looks like. Um, 
If you go to the Smart Growth America blog, there is a write-up about each one of these projects that we've talked about and the other two that we did not talk about that will have more information on it. And the BART folks have also shared a lot of this on their social media. Um, so following them on Twitter and Instagram, you'll be able to see more photos of that as well. Mark, anything else to add to that? No, I don't know where she, uh, she, where she uh, researched the mm -hmm. images, but I will say that I love the concept of taking museum pieces, right, that are usually behind plexiglass in archival boxes and tissues and putting that out in the public on the rail system. The concept of that was, um, was inter very interesting, I thought. Yeah, and the video that she made with that too really helped to explain it in a different way through moving images rather than just a static image on a poster. So really all of the parts that she put together in that project worked in tandem to, to tell a much fuller and broader story. Um, let's see. Bruce has a couple other questions. Bruce, we'll come back to those. Um, another question is, do you have examples of art being used to help show a municipality's or agency's commitment to a transportation investment being intended for current residents as opposed to wealthier, whiter folks moving into the neighborhood? Um, I think that, that the Oakland example is, the Oakland project is a really great example of that. Um, and really the, the mayor invested in that. And there was someone from the mayor's team in several of our uh, team meetings for the project. So they were invested not only at the very end for the unveiling, but closer to the beginning and through the process itself. Um, Mark, is there anything else about that that you'd, that you'd add? I think that's a good example, Jen. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say that, you know, it, it's not necessarily new for transportation agencies to be working with artists, but we're seeing it more and more now. And so I think the number of case studies that will be coming out um, will start to get bigger. Um, the forward issue that um, we dropped in the chat here is also a good resource to look at different projects that have happened around the country in recent years um, that help show an investment in a transportation agency. Some of them get to a current resident rather than you know, people who are moving in and gentrifying a neighborhood. Um, but that's pretty nuanced. And so I think, I think we'd have to do a little more research to find some that actually meet that, that really specific um, ideal. But I will say that in conversations that I've been having with folks, both artists and different trans, transit agencies, this notion of hyper-locality has been coming up more and more and really thinking about the sort of radius around the project and who's affected by that and thinking really close to home about what kinds of projects and resources should be happening. Um, so I think we're going to start seeing more examples of those projects, Jennifer. Um, let's see. So Bruce asks, um, how do we choose the artists we showed today? That we, um, we put out an open call. So we, we had artists who applied and entered their information who were interested in working on this project. Um, we also then, once we selected the different locations and transit agencies, we talked to um, nonprofits and arts and culture organizations, um, folks in those communities who knew artists and could understand the goals of the projects um, to see if there were any, any artists that they thought would be great for this. We started to compile a list and then we, we talked to the artists too to understand their interest, um, how they might approach something like this, and then um, interviewed the, the cities or the agencies then interviewed the artists as well to get a feel for how they might work together. Because in this instance, we're not just commissioning an artwork, we're commissioning an artist to do this artwork with us, right? So we really wanted to understand um, not only what they would do, but, but how, how it would be to work with them. I think that's a really important part of this. 
And even for this round, Jen, um, we made sure to reach out. If you remember that, um, what I call that extension ladder, mm -hmm. um, making sure we reached out to non-arts organizations too. Um, BIDs, chambers, um, and up and down the ladder too, from state arts agencies, regional arts agencies, local social justice communities. So we're trying to make sure that um, those opportunities <clears throat> are communicated through uh, traditional and non-traditional channels. Thanks for that, yeah. And then Bruce has a follow-up about the, his first question. How can the artist blend a personal vision with a publicly palatable artwork? <laughs> big question, and I think one that is ever occurring, right? Mark, you have worked both on the municipal side of things. You're also a public artist. Um, what have you seen in your range of experiences that start to, to address this? You know, my knee-jerk reaction, I'm going to speak as an artist. My knee-jerk reaction is, uh, what? who are we making it for? Right. In the public realm, um, we have to have a certain detachment to it in order to augment it, edit it, make it fit the space. Um, I will share that Ashley, who did the installation at the Bonneville Transit Center, uh, concurrently had a solo show at the UNLV Gallery, just her work. And that was quite a challenge for her, right? To have a solo show in a quiet, clean, uh, well-lit environment, and then change those gears to work with a 24 seven location um, where she wouldn't necessarily be attracting the same type of audience. Because she was a graphic designer, she had a certain ability to communicate, to take feedback, to um, augment and strengthen ideas and concepts, which helped her in communicating um, not only with the agency, but those writers. She did a fantastic um, survey. Um, I think it was via Instagram, where she was asking writers um, their thoughts. She was still able to process it through her innate graphic design mentality. So it's, uh, it's, it's, there's some dualism in there, Bruce, that, that, that comes with that. We've got about five more minutes. Um, I've got a question that we could both talk about, but I'll, I'll pose it to you, Mark. You worked really closely with Ashley in, in Las Vegas on that Bonneville Transit Center project. Um, and we also did some, some sort of training sessions with all of the artists in all five of the cities. If you were working as a transit agency and wanted to bring an artist in, what are some of the things that you saw in working on this project and in this next round of, of the project? What kinds of things have you seen that an artist needs support on that a, a transit agency could be thinking about to provide in addition to um, you know, the, the funding and that sort of thing, right? That what pops out to you as far as that goes? I think if the transit agency or any other department agency, right? Health, human services, um, if they can crystallize as much as they can, the issue, the challenge, you know, artists are creative problem solvers the problem prepared. And I, I think if they can identify that, it helps the artist know what the end goal is. Added to that would be support that we wouldn't necessarily immediately think about. Can we provide artists access to our vendors? Um, if this is a, if there's time restrictions, a cold call from an artist to get um, a price on silk screening metal signs or something like that is gonna take longer rather than having the city make that phone, initial phone call and link those two people together. So that helps. Um, having storage area for the artist to 
keep work. So there's not, so their commute back and forth isn't as laborious, carrying, hauling stuff. Uh, definitely promoting, I'll switch to marketing now, like promoting the opportunity internally and creating awareness internally, even with agencies you think might not be interested is interesting for the artist in order to promote, promote the art, art, the artwork and the message. Mm -hmm. So those are some real quick things I can think of with Jen for that. Great. Um, I would also add, I think every one of these projects, they gave the artist a free transportation pass so they could ride the rails or the bus for free and really understand the experience of the user, you know, the transit user so that they could address the the challenge from that vision. I also think that the BART project, they had an in-house printer. And so they just had, yes. they just had Tasha's posters and things printed in-house. So she didn't have to pay for that. It didn't come out of her budget. It was a resource they already had. They could manage all of that. So I think something to think about is like, what are all these other things that, that you can provide to an artist to help them meet your goals and challenges um, and really think about it as a collaboration and a partnership instead of an artist just doing something for you. Um, I think that will open up some of the, yeah. some of the opportunities too. And I think the, the messaging behind this, the, the public service announcement behind this should open up doors as well. So if inviting that elected official to be there for the opening, if the public information officer can get that to the local news agency. I mean, of course we wanna see the artists flourish, but we also want all of us to be safe and we want all, we want this message to be extended to the community as deep as, we, as, as possible. Awesome. We are at time. So we're gonna, we're gonna say thank you one more time to our funders. We really appreciate your support and, and help in, in us being able to do more activities like this. Thank you to everybody who came um, we're, we're really excited that you are here and we'd love to hear from you. So um, Mark and I, you can find our email addresses on the forecast website, which is forecastpublicart.org. Um, and then we'll also follow up tomorrow with a link to this recording and to our latest issue of Forward. Thank you, Mark. Great to see you. Jen, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Bye.